20 years ago came a reform so momentous it divided a nation. for a packet of cigarettes and chewing gum. It's gone up from 80 to 90. The goods and services tax was born through an unlikely partnership. What can we agree on? How can we work? I was not going to allow this huge reform uh, to go down the drain. It led to the ruin of an entire political party. And this is not simply a symbolic objection. It's a tale of power, betrayal, determination and shrewd statecraft. This is the story of how the GST came to be. By the time the GST took effect in 2000, the idea had been around for a generation. Uh, the concept of consumption tax on services. The GST is a great bag of smelly fish. It's time to fight back. The idea proved so unpopular, it seemed the GST was finished for good. There's no way that uh, GST will ever be part of our policy. Never, ever. Never, ever. It's dead. Now, we changed our position, and I was conscious of never, ever, and they did throw it at me, and that was fair enough. We fed his own words back to him, the never, ever um, man. Well, I am going back on what I said. I accept that. And if the public is unhappy with my explanation for going back on it, then they will throw me out. And they nearly did. John Howard lost the popular vote in the 1998 election, but despite the swing against him, the government ended up with a comfortable majority of seats in the lower house, and therefore the right to form government. By the middle of 1999, the Howard government was tantalisingly close to the finish line in its GST odyssey. It held 37 of the 76 seats in the Senate, too short of a majority. Its first order of business to court the independent Tasmanian crossbencher, Brian Harradine. I had hopes that Brian Harradine might support it. It was Brian Harradine who was thought to be leaning in the direction of it. They were, he was the one that the government was wooing. The question is whether I'm going to be a party to imposing an impersonal, indiscriminate tax on my children, my grandchildren, and their children for generations to come. I cannot. The first alternative was to forget about it. Well, I wasn't going to do that. Secondly was to um, try and negotiate with the Democrats. Uh, thirdly was to um, have another election. Well, I don't think the public wanted another election. And so, facing a hostile Senate, John Howard and Peter Costello turned to the only other place they could, the seven senators of the Australian Democrats, who until then had campaigned against the GST. Hello. I actually thought for a while myself, there's no way this will get passed because the, the gap is too huge, the red lines, uh, the government's not coming anywhere near them. Um, but uh, yeah, those red lines, not to be so red or not to be there at all. It was this pairing, John Howard and the Democrats' leader Meg Lees, that shocked people outside and even inside the party. The Democrats were whole firm on food. No retreat and no surrender. We had balance of power. We basically had all the cards. There was no political benefit or gain for the Democrats in supporting the thing at all anyway. Within a few short weeks in June 1999, the Howard government had gone from woe to go plan for a 10% goods and services tax, even agreeing to exclude certain essentials like basic food to shield people on lower incomes. I was concerned about all of the carve-outs, but it was either or, either you accepted the fundamental carve-out the Democrats insisted on, or you gave the whole game away. Well, I wasn't in the business of giving the whole game away. So that's part of the weapon governments often use on small parties in the Senate, or any party in the Senate is you know, we've got to pass this now and it's really urgent and you know, it might have been urgent for them but it, it wasn't, uh, it didn't need to be urgent for the Democrats. A note for the press gallery was suddenly filled with people so it must be an important matter. On the 28th of June 1999 the GST went to a final vote. There being 38 ayes and 30 noes the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Only five of the Democrats seven senators would back the government. Uh, but I need to put on record my 
personal uh, decision not to support uh, the uh, goods and services tax. Well, in the final vote and, and a few other votes during the legislation and various amendments, um, I crossed the floor, myself and Natasha stott Despoir crossed the floor and voted separately to the other uh, five Democrat senators at the time. The chicken walk. Thank you, <laughs> Senator West. Out they go. The day before it was introduced, it felt like Christmas Eve to me. I remember wandering around uh, thinking, golly, how is all this going to go? We're we going to get some Christmas presents or they're all going to, it's going to be a big fizzle. Uh, but it turned out, I think in the long run, the two have been accepted, but it was quite a struggle. Bread What's the bread? What's it going to, up or down? Down 10 cents actually. It was a credit to the determination of John Howard that he persisted personally with the negotiations. I think Peter Costello had almost given up on it, to tell you the truth. But it was Howard that alone, in his determination to drive it through, made the concessions. For the Democrats, the motto to keep the bastards honest would be forever tainted. Meg Lees was prepared to negotiate. And the consequence for her? Essentially, her party was wiped out subsequently in elections. The Democrats lost all credibility. Uh, I guess that's a classic case study in uh, walking both sides of the street and ending up getting uh, a giant truck come down and clobber you in the middle of it. We have achieved exactly what we set out to do. Our promise at the election campaign was to make this package fairer and greener. You had to argue, first of all, that it was good for the nation and you had to argue that it was fair. And that's something that I set out to do when I finally embarked upon what I facetiously called the great tax adventure.